May 17th, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Lee Carter. Inside Mr. Carter's blacksmith shop, the wind is blowing and the noise you hear is the tin on the roof. Hmm. Mr. Carter, where were you born? Northwest of Foss, about all six, seven miles like that, half dug out. And when's your birthday? May 22. That's next Sunday, incidentally. Next Sunday. That'll make me 76. 76. So that means you were born in 1907. Seven. 19, I'm just a little older than the state. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your father? Uh, E.L. Cotter. He's dead now, the late E.L. Cotter. Mm hmm. So your father was E.O. Carter? Uh-huh. He was E.O. Carter. Where was he from? Originally from somewhere down here in Texas. I don't know just exactly where. Mm -hmm. Who was your mother? Who was my mother? Yes, sir. Her name was Evans. 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 What was her first name? Eudora. Eudora Evans. Was she from Texas also? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's born down here at Red Oak, I believe it was. How come your folks came to Oklahoma? Well, my grandmother's health, for one thing. The doctor told her she had to get out and change climates all for her health. And so uh, they ended up here at Waterford. Mm -hmm. Well, did she have tuberculosis or? And that's no. the reason a lot of people came out west. Uh-huh. No. I don't know just what her trouble was, yeah. to just tell the truth about mm -hmm. the matter. But uh, some kind of a nervous disorder, I think. And, uh, they come up here and he run a dray wagon. He had a team. and. Uh, He'd haul things for people. This was the end of the railroad. And uh, he'd take freight and stuff like that. He freighted from here to Colony down here. Colony, you know, is an Indian town down there. And mm -hmm. sure that had that Seeger Indian school. And he hauled the brick that uh, built that school. He's a blind man, practically blind. He'd uh, take a load down and start back at night, tie the r lines up the front of the wagon there, and lay down the back of the wagon, and go to sleep, let the team come home. They knew the road better than he did. Mm -hmm. And when they'd stop, he'd wake up. Did uh, you know Mr. Seeger? Did you meet him? No, I didn't know him personally. Mm -hmm. Now, his daughter is Lena Klump, I believe was her name, was uh, the postmaster at Colony for years and years. She was a special friend of one of my aunts. But I never knew the man. Yeah. Did. Uh did your folks settle on the farm here in Weatherford? No. No, they come here and did, bought a house up in the northwest part of town, which was northwest part of town. Now, then it's about the central part of town now mm -hmm. for the west side. Yeah. And then uh, this shop all at the same time. So your father bought this shop about the same time he moved to Weatherford? Mm -hmm. Yes. How come he bought the blacksmith shop? Well, he had done a little work in his uh, his brother-in-law's shop for a few years after he'd get his crop laid by. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd go in and help his brother-in-law. Kind of got on the trade a little bit. Back I guess that's the thing he probably liked better than carpenter work because he was a good carpenter. Yep. Yeah. Bought the shop. Who did he buy the shop from? He got it from the bank. 
I don't know just how the bank got a hold of it, whether it was a foreclosed mortgage or what. Mm -hmm. But the bank got a hold of it, and he bought it from the bank. I knew both of the men that built the shop. What were their names? One of them was Charlie Pig. One was Charlie Payne. They were both, both Charlies, Pig and Payne. And uh, the Pig left here and went to Oklahoma City. Payne was uh, finally ended up after he, he worked for us a while. I bought a shop in Geary. How come they sold the shop? Or did what? Oh, how, oh, you say you have the bank got a hold of the bank it. Bank got a hold of yeah, it, but okay. I don't know how they got a hold of it. Yeah. Okay. Were they? When did the? When had they come to Weatherford to set up the shop? The pain and pig. Yeah. I don't know when they come to Weatherford, but the shop was built all about the turn of the century. Yeah. Um, was it the, is it the same size as it was when your father bought it, or did he add on to it? Or as far as the outside of the building, with the exception of this side stuff here, uh -huh. is just the same. There wasn't any ceiling board or anything on the inside of it; uh -huh. just just a shell. And. Uh, Dad put this stuff inside there after he got a hold of it and all the machinery. How long did, you, did uh, your folks go up to Falls before they came to Weatherford? Yes. Uh, his folk, his father lived out there. And now, now, I don't know how long that he had lived there or how much of Dad's life he put in out there. I don't know that. And uh, I didn't, uh, just didn't think anything about it and pay any attention to asking questions like that till it got too late. There wasn't anybody to answer them. Do you have any memories of false? Oh, yeah. As a child, what was the town like? What was it like? Well, at one time, it was a thriving little community. I've seen the time when people was on the streets like they used to be in Oklahoma City. Just, of course, it's a little town, mm -hmm. but it didn't take so many people to fill it up, but as the guy says, so many people per square foot. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a booming little town at one time. Was it mainly a farming town? Yeah, it was a farming town. Did your folks have a farm out there, Bob? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they had a farm out there. What and kind of chores did you do on that farm as a child? I didn't do anything that I know of because, I, well, I was just six years old when I left there. And I uh, hadn't come to the chore in age. Mm -hmm. so we you're finally, six? oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finally, Dad built a house, got away from that hill that the dad had dug dugout built in and uh, got up on the prairie out there and built a house up there. What was the inside of that dugout like? Well, I don't remember. We was way from there before I got yeah. to where I could remember things mm -hmm. that stuff. And uh, my huh. mother tells a story about one time I was, she put me when I was a baby on the bed there to sleep and she heard a thud and went in there and there's a great big old rattlesnake laying on the bed right beside of me, <laughs> falling out of the top. <laughs> uh, what did she do? She got me off of the bed. I guess. <laughs> oh, Lord. I don't remember about the snake. I don't know what his destiny was. <laughs> but I imagine she shot him. <laughs> <laughs> she was good with the gun. Good, bad moral. <laughs> How come you folks moved to Weatherford? 
on account of the school, I presume. Yeah. See, this has always been a school town. Yeah. Uh, so I, can, start I can remember up here when this college was just had, uh, well, just about, you might say just the high school. It was a normal, what they called a normal school. And uh, I remember when they added their first college work. It's just grown ever since. Mm -hmm. When did they add the first college work here? What, what? Uh, what year did they add the first college work here? Mm, let's see, it is probably in about the late teens. Mm -hmm. What What was the name of the school that you started to at Weatherford? Well, I started at Weatherford Public School here. Mm -hmm. and went till about the fourth grade. Then at that time, well, they had a training school up at the college, the normal school it was then. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was nothing but a tre teacher school. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get anything but just teacher's education out there. And that's one reason why I never did get a college education. Because uh, I went up there then from about the fourth grade and the, they used the, their training school there. You taught the teachers in, in their training school there instead of uh, putting them out over the country like they do now. And I finished the eighth grade up there and then come back down here and got into high school at the public school. And after I got out of there a few years, well, somebody got the idea that I needed to be on the school board, so I served eight years on the Board of Education up here. I learned a lot about human nature and various other things. <laughs> I wouldn't take anything for what I learned to do want any more of it. Yeah. As a Boy here in Weatherford, what were your chores around the blacksmith shop? What did you do to help your father? Oh, um, after school, now school was always hard for me. I had to do a lot of studying. I made decent grades, but it was hard for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I had to do when I got home from school was to get all my homework. And if there was any time left for that, why, well, I could either do some chores around the house, get in, clean out the stove, bring in coal and the kindling wood for morning, and, and uh, if there's any time left, why, well, then I could go play. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> in the then around the shop, why, well, uh, on Saturday and if I could convince my mother that I needed, that I wanted to go to the shop, or she'd let me come down here, well, I'd do a little stuff around. My first jobs, I guess, I did was turn a lawnmower grinder. That lawnmower grinder, I, it was hand powered with a crank, and. Uh, Dad would set the thing and get it on the blades where it need to go, and I'd stand there and turn that thing till I got that mowing machine ground. Mm -hmm. And I did that. Various other little things that I could, that he knew I could do, until, oh, I guess it is 25 or 20, no, it wasn't easy, yeah. It was too, about 20, 23 or 4, something like that, why I started working in here in the summer times and, uh, and things that I could do. And incidentally, I had to do most anything. And uh, until 26, Dad got tangled up in that joint one day, just about, just about a month before high school was out before I graduated from high school. He got his hand cut up in here and swooped bones out. Everything he had, just about that much left of his hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to quit 
take the shop over. Had to have somebody to do it, run it. So I, I wasn't going to go ahead and go to school anyway because I wasn't about to leave here and and uh, go somewhere else to go to school. And all I could get here was a teacher's education. And I thought that was for the birds, but I found out later that about as good a racket as any of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My sister went on and got a college education. She taught school for a few years and married a man. Of course, one of the professors over here at OSU. He died here. <laughs> Did you know your grandparents? Oh, yes. Were either one of your grandfathers in the Civil War? No. A great grandfather was. One of my great grandfathers was that Dr. Conger that uh, was a surgeon, Dr. Conger. Yep. He's in. Uh, all listed over here in that library. He's at Congress, wherever it is here in Washington. Hmm. And uh, as a Civil War surgeon. Mm -hmm. uh, where were your grandparents from? Really, I don't know where they come from. They were just a. Uh, they're mixed up. They had some French and English. A little bit of Indian blood, had a little in Cherokee Indian mixed in, somewhere back down the line. And incidentally, that old Indian squaw was well liked. Quite a girl. Mm -hmm. name was Juanima. Juanima? Uh huh. And she married your grandfather? No, it's a little further back than that. <laughs> I don't know just how far back mm -hmm. it is. But, uh, so originally, I just don't know where I, where you might say they come from. <laughs> yeah. What about World War One? Well, I was just old enough when it quit. See, I was 11 years old when the war was over. And uh, just old enough to begin to think about if they didn't get that thing stopped pretty quick, I was in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they got it stopped there in '18. And uh, then you know we had a lull there for quite a while. Didn't need any soldiers. And when it come to World War II, I was just in the top of the bracket just put near too old to be a vendor, but in the top of the bracket, and then this occupation here, they, I guess really that's all that kept me out of it, yeah. because they um, kept a check on me, what are you doing now, are you still there in the shop, what are you doing? I had to fill out a form every once in a while. And, and, uh, they kept track of what I was doing, mm -hmm. but they never did call on yeah. me. Can you describe Armistice Day in Weatherford? Yes, sir. What was that day like? Very definitely. They had a great big celebration up here, and incidentally, it had a tragic end. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that one anvil back here, this one over here on this side, was mm -hmm. used in the celebration. They uh, did then what they call shooting anvils. They take one anvil, lay it up, upside down, and there's a basin in the bottom of that anvil, just about like a half a football. That is, you slice the football in two this way. You yeah. See. Then they put powder in that. Use this black powder and lay a fuse on it and set the oven upright on top of it. And such a racket you never heard in your life, and that thing blew off. 
supposed to just blow the envelope down on the ground. And uh, they got this anvil and took it up there and got one out of another shop, took it up there. And they were just lots of people there. They just crowded in, you know, and they had a big doing. And uh, there's a couple of fellows that decided they'd make them a cannon. They got a two inch pipe, about six inches long, screwed cap on the end of it. And they come down here and wanted Dad to drill a hole in the end of the cap so they could put a fuse in it. Dad told him, I heard the conversation. I know, know just exactly what it was. He told me he wouldn't drill it. He said, you kill somebody for that. He said, I won't kill it. Oh, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. And then they said, I wanted to know if uh, he cared if they drilled a hole themselves. I said, well, there's a drill back there. He says, go, go on drill it if you want to. I won't do it. And they did it. Took it up there and shot it a few times. Busted it. And instead of destroying it or taking it away, they just threw it down. And here come an old boy by the name of Merkel. His name was James. I knew him well. He said, I'm going to shoot it one more time. So he loaded it up and shot it. And uh, it busted. The end of it hit him right up above the eye, right up here, and just scooped his brains out. And them two men come back to the shop. Told Dad, says we wish you'd ta we'd have taken your advice. Says we killed us a man. Mm -hmm. As a, on Armistice Day. Mm-hmm. Was there a big parade in town? Big celebration? No, I don't think they had any parade as near as I remember. But they just all, everybody come to town to see what was going on. Yeah. And uh, as you know, in that day, there wasn't any such thing as radio or anything to get news. You had to wait for, wait for a newspaper if you got any news. And uh, of course, they found out, come to town, I guess, just to see what was going to go on, what was going to happen. You know, there was two days there that they celebrated, one on the 7th and one on the 11th. How come those two days? Well, it is a, a little news mix-up some way. And, uh, the news got out that the armistice had been signed on the 7th. And uh, they had them a celebration on the 7th. And then when the next paper come out, they said it was all false. There was nothing to it. <laughs> and then they did get the news on the 11th that it was signed. So they celebrated again. Mm -hmm. Did the Depression have much effect on the blacksmith shop? Yes. Good, I'd say. Good. I'd have to say good. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, well, there wasn't any money. It isn't like it is now. Seemed like there's plenty of money floating around for some people. And, uh, but they won't buy anything. But the way it was then, didn't take but a little bit of money to buy anything, but there wasn't any money to buy with. And uh, the farmers couldn't buy new machinery because they didn't have any money. And they had to, had to repair the old machinery. Consequently, they'd come in here and get the machinery repaired and we had plenty of work to do. And, uh, of course, you didn't get a big price either, but I got the price for a bushel of wheat for sharpening the plows here. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that is 25 cents. But that is a bushel of wheat. Now I get $2 for sharpening the plows here, but you see, that's just about a half bushel of wheat. Here. So 
Mexico, and I didn't have, my salary was low enough that uh, I didn't have to pay any income tax, and I made a dollar or a dime, it is mine, and the big, big percent of people, especially if they were just single men, which like I was then, just single men, why, if they could get a place that they could work and uh, get their room and board and 50 cents a day, they was lucky. Mm -hmm. But I could go home with, I could count on about a dollar and a half for a day's work. And of course I ate and slept at home, didn't have any board bill to pay. And uh, with it that way, when even up until uh, after my wife and I was married, we got married in '33. That is the year of the bank holiday, and we got caught with uh, a price ceiling on our plow work. We couldn't raise it. We sharpened plows for years for 25 cents, even after money got better. And, uh, of course, when the banks closed, well, they got everything I had but what I got in my pocket. And when I married, I had $14. <laughs> Where'd you meet your wife? She's here, come here going to school. Mm -hmm. She was born in the Congo. Yeah, and what's her full name? Her name was Robert. Robert. Viola, V-E-O-L-A, May. Roberts. She don't like it if you call her Viola either. <laughs> but anyway, her dad was, um, uh, followed the gin business. Cotton gin? Cotton gin. And oil mill business. And also, he run, at one time up there at Wakongo, he run a candy kitchen, a confectionery along with it. And, uh, he was a man that he couldn't stay in one place too long. He'd get restless. He'd move on to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got her high school education at Quanah, Texas. He was in the mill business down there. When they got started on a little oil boom business around out here in the western part of the state, well, he come back up here and uh, bought her his, uh, well, bought Viola's mother and dad's place out there. And uh, that's where she was living when I met her, but she's come down here going to school. After we married, we've been right here ever since. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, did your father make wagon wheels and did he work oh, on yes. the wagon machinery? Yeah, he did, and I did too. I got in on that. Oh, well, I, I just wondered whether you did. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you remember the first blacksmith job you ever did? No, way. Okay. I don't. There have been so <laughs> many since then. There was just, uh, well, I had no reason to even think like, think about that I would need to or ever be interested in. In fact, that's the first time I ever thought about it, I guess. That's what my first job was. <laughs> I just wonder, just uh, wonder. I have no idea. Where did the term blacksmith come from? I have no idea. I've often wondered about that, about the term blacksmith. Maybe it's because there's always black all the time. Mm -hmm. And the word smith, then, a repairman, why, well, uh, chances are that might have had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's a dirty job. But it's good, clean dirt. Yes. 
I don't know of anything that I really would rather do that there's any work about it than write what I was doing. Well, you're your own boss, really. You can work when you want. Yes. But you know, that doesn't work out so good either at times. Now, back in the Depression days, why, well, uh, you had lots of trouble over the price of things. And in fact, I remember one particular instance. We had an old boy that lived out northwest of town that uh, thought he had to, I, I didn't know that then, but then I found out later, he thought he had to jump all over me and fuss and whine about the price of anything to keep keep me in line on the price. But I soon found out that it didn't make any difference if you charged him 15 cents for a quarter job, he'd holler just as loud as he would if you charged him a quarter for a 15 cent job. And don't think a dime wouldn't make a difference because it did. But he'd come in here and he'd First thing he'd start out with, what are you going to charge me? And maybe he'd ask me two or three times before he got me told what he wanted to do. Well, you couldn't give him an answer on a question like that. You didn't even know what what he what he wanted done. And of course, I'd figured just as close as I thought I could. Oh, you're robbing me! You're robbing me! It's too high. And well, he says, I can get it done over at such and such a place for so much. But you knew when you priced it, you was going to get to do the job. He wasn't going to take it. He'd throw it down on the floor and out. He'd go uptown and ask you first, though, when you'd have it done, you'd tell him. Go uptown just like, like he's just mad as he could be when he went out of here. Set time come, or you come in here and, well, did you get me fixed up? Yes. Well, how much is it? Well, he knew because I'd already told him. Tell him, pay you off, he's all smiles, maybe stand around and visit with you for a while. <laughs> and while he'd leave and go on off. And it's, uh, so he, <laughs> and he'd come in here, just kept that up. How much you gonna charge me? How much you gonna charge me? And uh, I did work for him for years. One day I got tired of it. And I said, well, "No, I said, why don't you take him but take it over there?" Well, he said, "I don't like the kind of work you do." Well, that told me <laughs> what he wanted. He wanted the he wanted the quality of work that we put out, and. Uh, I don't mean to brag, but we always have put out a first-class job. And he wanted that kind of a job for the price of just a throw-together job. And that's what you'd have had to done if you'd have done it for any less price. Mm -hmm. And uh, he moved, finally moved away from here. He went to Clinton. And uh, I didn't see him for several years. One day he come a-walking in the shop. He had two jobs. One of them, he started just the same way. And uh, one of them, I told him what I'd charge him for it. And I said, now this other one, I never did one like that before. I says, I can't tell you. But I says, I'll, uh, I'll treat you right on it. But he didn't gripe. He didn't do a thing. He was just as pleased as he could be with the price on both of them but he started out just the same way. And he turned and walked out. Well, he'd be back. And he walked out. I thought about it a minute, and I said, well, that man must be sick. <laughs> he didn't gripe. He must be sick. So the allotted time, if I remember correctly, it was about two weeks for him to come after he didn't come. And it rocked on for some time after that. And I just figured that, well, 
he decided being he didn't gripe that I'd hold him up on that one job. And he'd just leave them on my hands. And incidentally, a lot of them does that too. Die maybe, or move off, or change their mind, or something, you know. And uh, one day, though, he come walking in. Well, did you get me fixed up? Yes. Well, he says the reason I didn't come back when, when I said I was supposed to, he says I've been sick. <laughs> sure enough, he was sick. I guess. <laughs> and I've been sick. And couldn't come. Well, how much is it? I told him. He paid me off, didn't fuss about it, paid me off, and left. Never saw the man again. Just a little while after that, he got killed in a pickup race. And incidentally, I haven't had a gripe on a price, I guess, in four or five years. And I've got some pretty good tips, too. I got one tip here on an $85 job, one tip of, well, he gave me a check for $125. That's a pretty good tip. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's not too uncommon to get double your price. Mm -hmm. What about World War II? Well, I was just, they wasn't interested in me at all, other than kept track of what I was doing. Was there yeah. any, was there much work for the war effort in Weatherford during World War II? Did well, people organize like the Red Cross or? Yes, we had our Red Whatever. Cross telephone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was quite a little bit of work around. And of course, I did quite a little bit of government work. Mm -hmm. They had a school over here in this armory. And aviation school and uh, I built a bunch of guard you might say gates big metal gates to his guards what it was is a guard fence around a bunch of stuff and a bunch of test stands from both those engines on to test them with the props on them and they had to be put together too and I uh, built a bunch of them and I built one machine to um, test crankshafts with. And incidentally, the crankshaft laid right up over, over there. See it up there in the dark? Oh, yeah. Big, long crankshaft. Mm -hmm. That's out of an Allison airplane okay. engine. 12 cylinder job. And I. Well, they'll, uh, they'll open up if that's what you mean. Because it looks like they fold up. Well, yeah. This one, we intended for it to fold around this way and then go around. Mm -hmm. But uh, it don't quite match it. So we fold it just a little way and shoot the end of it back that way. Were these on the original building? Oh, no. Turn it around, honey. No, no these are. There's been several sets of doors in here, just like you need now, need another set. Oh. What about? That's a microphone. Okay, gotcha. What, <laughs> what about those doors? How long have they, they been there? They open to the outside. How long have they been there? Oh, probably 40 years. There's an old engine or something out there under that tree. What is that? I was peeking through the hole. <laughs> Out there under the tree. What is that? What's the that? disc roll? Roll these plow discs with you. See these plows discs? I have plows that have these great big discs on them. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, that's what that's for. I used to have it inside, but. Uh, the little portable rollers got all that business nearly, so I decided that, that I needed room in there worse than I did the disc roller in there, so I moved it outside. And uh, the disc, there's a turntable down here. That's it right there. Uh -huh. 
and there's a bar sits right in here and comes out this way and that turntable sits right up here and the disc bolts right here and it rolls between these rollers and uh, you pull this screw around here to tighten the tension on it and uh, there's no springs or anything in that and uh, you just, just pull it down on it and you can see here where it's been welded I broke two or three of these shafts here where they're three inches through. Break. Yeah. I uh, think he's going around the block. <laughs> so I, I moved it out here. It hadn't been out here more than all oh, two or three weeks, I guess. Well, until the uh, old boy come to the shop with a set of those one way discs in his pickup. He'd already tore his discs one way down. And one me rolled. Well, man, I threw that thing out in the yard. He was pretty disappointed. The man would be, too, because he already tore his disc down. Yeah. That's the reason he used those little portable sure. rollers to keep from tearing that disc down. I told him, well, I'd move it back in and roll his disc for him. He wasn't in any hurry, and he was. And I got thinking about it. Well, I might be able to remodel that thing a little bit garden tractor on it. So I took this shaft out and it had a big wheel. Is he laying right there? Yeah. Uh -huh. His clutch wheel. And it had run right here. And a belt down in, but I couldn't figure out how to get a belt on my engine mm -hmm. and do it. So I took the thing out, disposed of the clutch, didn't need it anyway. And welded a piece on it here and come out here and put this wheel on it. Machined it down. That's the job I did in that lathe in there. Uh -huh. Machined it down and uh, put it on there. Then I run the tractor around up here. Long belt. Run right around that thing I rolled his dish for it. <laughs> and I've rolled several sets after I got it out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It works. Yeah. It's pretty low geared. Yeah, I, I can see that. What's this over here, though? Well, that's what I rolled. What, what I use. Oh, that's your tractor. Yeah. Good garden this.
Why? Deep. That yeah. engine runs smooth. Mm -hmm. It really it does. Really does. How deep is your well deep. here? It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. How deep is your well? About 100 feet. See, it's still pumping. Oh, yeah. What's that cabinet? garden all that stuff down there. And, uh, I've had to put pipe in this and then jet rod here about all oh, three years ago I guess. And, uh, the pipe and jet rod and the labor on it cost me about two hundred dollars and I decided I didn't need to work. I sold that bit down there. Concrete mixed off just there now. Then and uh, get some steel. Yeah, down there. She says, um, "You gonna sell that windmill?" Oh, I guess the wood. What you take for it? Thousand dollars. Well, do you want your check now? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> an easy sell. That's great. Now this thing here equalizes that pressure. See, the, the water goes in at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the compresses an air bubble here. And then as the plane goes down, why it, it shoves the water out and the air does. And you can't tell to save your life on the end of the sprinkler if it's just as well. Do, is it supposed to do that? Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Oh, you mean leak that way? Yeah. No. <clears throat> Have good water pressure. Yeah. That's good water. Well, I want to thank you. You're quite welcome to come back. Yeah. Um, 